next session is uh, titled Creative Exploration Karl Marx, Creative Exploration of Karl Marx, um, which is again going to be rendered by none other than Professor Kaiser Huck. Uh, a bit of an introduction about Sir. Uh, well, he's the Dean of School of Arts and Humanities, uh, but he's also a poet, essayist, and translator. He's the only poet in Bangladesh writing in English who is widely anthologized. He is also a recipient of Bangla Academy Literary Award in the category of translation. And he has also received the Sherwin W. Howard Poetry Award in 2017 from Weber, the Contemporary West. He takes special interest in recitation as part of which uh, Sir will give us a creative exploration of Marx titled Karl Marx versus Nux Vomica 200 and Selected Poems. Please welcome Professor Kaiser Huck on the stage, please. Audience is encouraged to leave. <laughs> because after a long day of very serious deliberations, I think, uh, you know, it's natural to be a bit wary. Um, I have published a, an essay which is something of a spoof. And yet, I mean, the scholarship that it contains is authentic. <coughs> I'll just read out some excerpts from it. Karl Marx versus Nuts Vomica 200. Now, it struck me that um, there's no mention of homeopathy in the works of Michel Foucault. And yet, I mean, one would expect madness and civilization and the birth of the clinic to take note of homeopathy. But there's no mention of homeopathy. Now, Marx, um, Foucault, in uh, Madness and Civilization and the Birth of the Clinic, traces the genealogy of modern psychiatry and modern medicine. So in the classical age, the 17th and 18th, and most of the 18th centuries, the, the age of reason, the mad were incarcerated, uh, kept in chains, together with other unreasonable personages like prostitutes, blasphemers, and homosexuals. This system of ordering disorder ended with the introduction of the purportedly humane system of the mental asylum. And so you have reformers like Philip Pinel in France and uh, William Duke in England. In medicine, there was a change towards more precise empirical observation of symptoms and pathological details, and the teaching hospital was set up as the chief medical institution. Hahnemann, Christian Samuel Hahnemann, pioneered a parallel development and set up a rival system of medicine that gained wide popularity in 19th century Europe and America, and then rapidly lost that popularity as the 20th century got underway. Now, uh, and yet it's surprising because um, Hahnemann did a lot of the things that these other reformers in psychiatry and medicine were doing. Um, he said that in a treatment by psychological or psychical means, which we today call psychotherapy, was adequate for disorders that, quote, with but slight implication of the body originate and endure from emotional causes, etc., etc. What we now uh, categorize as neuroses. For more extreme disorders, medicines were prescribed, but according to the homeopathic principle of the law of similars, similia similibus curantur, like cures like. Now, and Hahnemann, um, I'll not go into the details, he uh, advocated 
meticulous attention to detail in uh, introduced uh, public health reform, etc. And he had a lot of admirers in, to start with. Goethe hailed him as the new Theophrastus Paracelsus. Um, but he had his detractors at the same time. Um, for example, Oliver Wendell Holmes published um, an essay, Homeopathy and Other Kindred Delusions. And the struggle between the two therapies went on, and it was a fight to the finish. Allopathy triumphed, and homeopathy was eventually relegated to the status of alternative or complementary medicine. Meanwhile, something very interesting happened. Homeopathy found a new home in South Asia. It arrived on our shores during Hahnemann's lifetime and steadily gained popularity until today we find homeopathic physicians in every neighborhood, in city and small town and in every village market. The number of homeopathic physicians in South Asia numbers many times the figure for the rest of the world. This is authentic data from the internet. India has become the global center for publishing homeopathic books. I spotted some in the display window of a specialized bookshop in Berlin in 1990. Books on homeopathy published in India, being sold in Germany, the home of homeopathy. <laughs> now, anyone, anyone growing up in this subcontinent will associate homeopathy with a certain aura of charm, mystery and romance. Now, every child knows that there's allopathy and homeopathy. Allopathy is frightful, the injections and whatnot. And homeopathy is pleasant. See? It is dispensed in neutral tasting liquids or sachets of faintly sweet tasting powders or tiny white globules soaked, as I now know, in alcohol. The globules melt on the tongue, leaving an ethereal sensation. The tiny bottles, once empty, become whistles, blowing to them at a certain angle through pursed lips produces a sweet, sharp note that floats like soap bubbles in the air. So, it's very pleasant, and it has to, be some, to, to have something mysterious and magical, despite its uh, scientific claims. Now, let's skip a bit. In India, there are many recorded successes of homeopathy. The Maharaja Ranjit Singh was the first celebrity uh, patient. He was suffering from paralysis of the vocal cords, accompanied by swelling of the feet. His court physicians couldn't cure him. Then a homeopath from Europe visiting India was called in and he cured the Maharaja with Dulkamara in the sixth potency. He was appointed court physician. Um, in Calcutta, Dr. Mah Mahendralal Shalka, the second medical graduate of Calcutta University, converted to homeopathy and uh, cured Ishochandu Bidashagur's asthma and started the subcontinent's first homeopathic journal. Other uh, uh, celebrities who endorsed homeopathy include Ramakrishna, Aurobindo Ghosh, Motilal Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath, in fact, used to practice homeopathy and bargain. And uh, in one of the hill stations where he used to sojourn, he became known, well known as a doctor 
we're going to have to go because of the homeopathic medicines he dispensed free of cost. Now, it should be obvious by now that homeopathy has to be drawn into the, into the discourse about Orientalism. What do we find here? It originated in the West and then it was it emigrated to the East. And it was welcomed like as a long lost relative almost. And commentators were not long in pointing out the family resemblances. Homeopathy is kindred to Ayurveda. Sanskrit tags from the Ayurveda Shastras were found to express the same thing as the homeopathic law of similars. Similars. Vishashya visham aushadham. Poison cures poison. Homeopathy's life force is comparable to the Ayurvedic prana. Both systems are holistic. Physicians of both systems will take into account the patient's personality type, his likes and dislikes, fears and anxieties, his lifestyle, ways of thinking, etc. Homeopathy is akin in principle to the oriental martial arts of Judo and Jiu Jitsu. The tint of spirituality in homeopathy is compatible with oriental tradition. Homeopathy advocates moderation in one's lifestyle, like Buddhism. One could go on. Now, in theorizing about it, I find Ashish Nandi more useful than or the usual orientalist discourse. He teaches that the constituents of a culture fall into two broad categories. One is dominant, the other is sidelined or repressed. What is dominant in the West is akin to what is sidelined in the East and vice versa. So in the, in the West, allopathy is associated with all those uh, characteristics which are listed in textbooks of Orientalism, see, in binary opposition. And the uh, you know, homeopathy is associated with the ones associated with the East. Uh, in the East, it's the, the dominant ones are the homeopathic traits and the allopathic traits are the sidelined or uh, repressed ones. I wonder if one can talk of homeopathic cultures and allopathic cultures. Much as Paul Bowles distinguishes between alcohol drinking and kiff smoking cultures. Now, Foucault left out homeopathy from his account because he was interested in drawing a picture of what is distinctively Western. Taking note of homeopathy would have messed up the picture. But his commitment to the integrity of the West is also his limitation. For the West has the East as its underside, and vice versa. Now, Karl Marx, with his obsession with dialectical oppositions, his Eurocentrism, his distaste for Oriental ways, definitely belongs with allopathic medicine. Which, now, those who are antipathetic towards Marxism and violent revolutions or have reservations regarding them may well invoke homeopathy as a philosophic ally. Turgenev, who witnessed the collapse of the 1848 uprising and had been sympathetic towards its aim to change society, did not share the sense of desolation suffered by his friends Bakunin and Herzen because he put his faith in quote unquote his own words, the homeopathy of science and education. Practicing homeopaths too are likely to be antipathetic towards Marxism. I heard an amusing anecdote from the poet Shahid Kadri, some of whose poems I'll read out after this. He knew of a homeopathic physician who, whenever the conversation in his chamber turned to the revolutionary threat posed by Marxists, 
declared with retroactive relish that if only he were present at the right time and place, he would have nipped the pernicious philosophy in the bud with a dose of Nux Vomica 200. Dr. Hahnemann himself had commented that Nux Vomica was ideal for treating fiery, violent and malicious people. <laughs> Who knows, Marx thus dosed might have turned out to be an advocate of Ahimsa. <laughs> Let me end with a sketch for a short story around this theme. There is a homeopath, a full-time clerk who practices after work in a chamber fancifully styled Human Welfare Homeo Hall and situated in a building house, uh, housing a mosque. He's a pious man. He prays in the mosque before and after clinic hours. His friends talk of Marxism. It's still the Cold War age. He says he could have straightened out Marx with Max Formica 200. His friends love to hear him expatiate on this. Then he finds out that his only son has joined the Marxist party. He tries unsuccessfully to persuade his son to leave the party. His life at home becomes fraught with tension. There are tantrums, the usual you know, shouting matches. And the son calls him a bootlegger because he used to help himself to the rectified spirit that the father uh, used for his homeopathic practice. And you see, the homeopaths get, uh, get more than the need of the rectified spirit and can easily sell some of it, which can, you know, can be imbibed after due dilution. The homeopath asks his son to have some homeopathic medicine, Nux Vomica 200. The son throws the bottle out of the window and calls his father a quack. So, everything goes topsy-turvy at home. His father is, doesn't know what to do. Uh, the father wants to throw the son out of his home. His wife counsels, patients, etc., etc. And then, one day, the boy meets a girl at a party meeting. They fall in love and get married. So the girl, boy brings a bride home. Uh, the bride is very uh, dutiful towards the mother-in-law. The mother-in-law is very happy. But father and son are not on speaking terms. But the girl pays due attention to her, her father-in-law's needs. Before long, she becomes pregnant. Uh, they try to persuade the young revolutionary to look for a job. And finally, the mother gets a dose of Nux Vomica 200 from her husband and handing it to the girl says she must get her husband to have it. He cannot resist it. He cannot resist her. Nothing seems to happen. The son becomes more sullen and active in politics until after the child arrives, a daughter. Miraculously, the son changes into a responsible father. He stops going to party meetings, starts scribbling for the civil service examination, passes and becomes a government officer. What did I tell you, the homeopath, the homeopath tells his friends? Nux Vomica 200. <laughs> well, his friends say, all's well that ends well. Now, uh, let's talk a few quotes. Uh, the poet Shahid Kadri, who died uh, a couple of years back, was a very good friend. I had been translating his poems, uh, you know, one every now and then. And I wanted to bring out a, a book of his poetry in translation. Unfortunately, he couldn't, uh, he didn't live to see it in print. But uh, he did see some of them, and he encouraged me to continue with the work. Um, he was not a very, not a political person, but he would, if pressed, he would say, yes, I'm a, I'm a Marxist. Meaning that he found the philosophy of Marx you see, congenial. You see? But he was never a sort of political animal as such. But um, one, I'll, I'll read 
three of his uh, later poems, which are interesting in the, the context of the uh, present uh, conference. One of his uh, very last poems, so two or three are uh, from his last day. Towards a singular century, I know I won't live to be a hundred. Still, in the twilight of my old century, like you, I too am forward looking while observing the decline of humane values. The ones who will make it to the new century, eyes bright with dreams, are they related to me? Are they my siblings? I don't know. But my sterile sky ceaselessly lights up with electric flashes, dreams. True voyagers set out with hearts light as balloons. This astute remark from a lonely, bohemian, absinthe-drinking, opium-smoking, 19th-century poet remains stuck in my memory like a maxim. Who then are the true voyagers to the new century? The penniless, despair-stricken, dream-deprived, politic elders? Or youths ignorant of death's dark artistry? who had dropped from their father's fecund kisses onto maternal wombs like blossoming lotuses and will soon scatter in every direction? Or is it you, me, our combative loquacious leaders, or the modern heads of state, heedlessly setting up nuclear reactors in country after country, whose shadowy allies are peripatetic arms dealers, just as layers of clouds linger after the rains in the skies of the familiar world, those of us who are hanging around the colorful ruins of our spoiled desires in this weary, dreamy century, carry like a deer carcass on our bowed backs the materialist interpretation of history. We are dressed in the tattered motley of a people's democratic shirt. Even now, our fondness for equitable distribution of wealth is blind faith glittering like rows of chandeliers at a celebration. And even now, television rubs salt in the wood when it shows the obscene exaltation of Western intellectuals at the sight of Lenin's toppled statue. The present intentions of those once united by the ideal of a classless society in the dream-inspired Soviet sphere are hard to fathom. They dip their hands in each other's blood and are indistinguishable from the brilliant colors of a seemingly serene sunset. Our old century is tinted by the blood of two world wars. My homeland is still soaked in fraternal blood, not to mention neighboring India, while civil war threatens Eastern Europe and virtually the whole of the old Soviet Union. Maternal tears, torrents of kinsmen's blood are in vain. Tell me, where shall we stand today with our wasted golden youth? We have lost faith in our decadent democracies, and my dreams for the present have been spent along the way like loose change. So I can only say over and over, I don't want my gory footprints on your singular century. I'll end with a couple of shorter poems. One is titled, A Revolution. In Manzur Elahi's garden, amidst gathering shadows at dusk. Several of us sat talking about this and that. Some mentioned Bangabundu. And in this connection, others brought in Allende's assassination and the history of the Chilean coup. Needless to say, Iran and Iraq came up too. 
the uncertain future of Cuba after Castro, the domination of the world by crooked businessmen, the helpless people of Bengal, always underfed. We talked of all this as we munched cashew nuts and sipped coffee. Slowly, night descended like a black cat on silent feet. Around our table and chairs, fireflies began to glow. It seemed they'd do so till eternity. We rose to going for dinner. Manzur Elahi said once more, power comes out of the barrel of a gun. Equality of classes cannot be achieved without bloodshed. No one voluntarily gives up class privileges. I looked out the window and noticed that Manzur Elahi's garden had been completely taken over by fireflies without firing a shot, without shedding a drop of blood. The last one, you know very well. It has an epigraph which has been used many times today. It was, uh, it's been used by Shamshad in his uh, message. It, it's just, I used it in my message. We didn't know that we were doing it. And it was used many times here. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. You know very well what the high-minded Plato said, what the philosopher Kant said, what Hegel said, what the great soul Buddha said, what Descartes and Bergson said, what Bertrand Russell said, what Whitehead said, what Jivananda Dash said, what Buddha Bosch or Vishnude said, what world famous poet Rabindranath said, what Michael Dutt, founding father of our poetic clan said. You know very well what Jesus the Son of God said, what Euripides of Sophocles said, what Michel Foucault said, what Derrida said, what Picasso or Paul Eluard said, or you all know very well what the great minds of this planet have said. My aim here is not to make a speech. I'm an insignificant human being. All I have to say is this, someone please rescue that ant floundering in water.